Do you feel that the, that the lost civilizations were as technologically advanced or more than we were? And I guess another, another, another you know, part B of that question is something that I feel like, you know, I'm obviously the advocate of your work, but the big hang up I think a lot of people have is, okay, so where are the buried computers? Where are the, where's the computer that's like 18,000? I mean, I think that there's sort of this notion that technology looks a certain way. Yeah, I'd no, love to sort of just talk about that. A certain way. And my answer to that is, if we really want to get to grips with history, Let's stop looking at history as a mirror. Let's start looking at it as a window through which we actually see what happened rather than projecting ourselves uh, onto, the, onto the past. There is no reason on earth why an earlier civilization should have followed the same technological route as us, even if it had the capacity to do so. It might have chosen for moral or other reasons uh, to do with the sacredness of the earth, not to exploit petrochemicals. For example, we've chosen to go that route. No, get, no certainty that an earlier civilization would have gone that route. And in the route that we have chosen to take, we have placed great emphasis on mechanical advantage. We do things by leverage, by mechanical advantage. And we're very good at that. We do amazing things with, with that. Um, but perhaps we've allowed other faculties of the human mind to lapse in the process. We've become dependent on mechanical technology and other faculties of the human mind, which are spoken of in traditions all around the world, uh, the faculties of telekinesis, of, uh, uh, for example, to move objects with the powers uh, of, of the mind, uh, of, of uh, telepathy and so on and so forth, are spoken of again and again in ancient traditions. Maybe human beings in general have those capacities, but maybe we've gone to sleep. We've been lulled into a state of sleep by our society. We're so proud of our technology. We're so impressed by its achievements. And my goodness, the achievements are extraordinary. Uh, they're overwhelming, actually, that we're just forgetting what else we might have done if we'd gone a different way. And I think that, that, that this is the answer, that, that the lost civilization of prehistoric antiquity was a very different civilization uh, from our own, and that it was not primarily about material things. It was primarily uh, about the nurture and growth of the human spirit. And that's reflected in the myths too, because it's when the lost civilization, Atlantis or whatever we wish to call, call, it, call it, strays from that path. When it plunges into materialism, when it loses sight of its spiritual goal, that's when the danger occurs. Is there, is there any possibility that, that members of a civilization in your opinion, could have survived and be somehow hidden among us still? No. Um, I think they were human beings just like us, but they are hidden amongst us in terms of their ideas. This is important to be clear. Um, ideas are what live or can live forever in human culture. And the idea of the lost civilization, of the magicians of the gods, of the civilizers, who went around the world trying to keep that light of civilization burning. Uh, that idea is very strongly impressed upon the memories of mankind. And no amount of rationalizing or scientific skepticism is going to get rid of it in our hearts. We all know it's true. So I've, I've, heard, you, I've heard you say and, and write that, you know, and, and it's obviously, it's, it's factual that um, as much as factual can be factual that the Egyptians have put their best minds to work for 3,000 years on the mystery of death. Yeah and this this touches exactly on what we're talking about just now because the ancient Egyptians were the inheritors of an earlier tradition. It was the tradition I believe of a lost civilization and the primary focus of that civilization was not upon material things and physical life uh, but on uh, eternal things. Uh, and, and the possibility of eternal life. Now, typically of our society today, when we talk about eternal or immortal, immortal life, people start thinking in terms of transhumanism, you know, that we're going to install all these gadgets in our brains or a ghastly, horrible, repulsive thought or, or, even, or even, you know, download our consciousness into, into a machine. What selfish and narcissistic thinking is that? Uh, we already have an incredible mechanism uh, for immortality. It's called reincarnation. 
um, why would one wish to be a transhumanist with, um, and, 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 and keep the same body forever or download one's consciousness into, into a, a machine when, when the mechanism of reincarnation allows us to live many different lives and, and benefit from the learning experiences that those different lives offer? Now, of course, I can't prove that reincarnation exists, um, but I, I happen to think it does. I think it's just as likely. I think it was Voltaire who said, it's, you know, it's no more improbable to be born twice than to be born once. <laughs> And, and, and actually, actually, why not? I mean, we could go into that. There's huge amounts of evidence for it. But there's, there's the thing. If, you're rein, if reincarnation is possible, then we are not our bodies. Whatever we are, we're not our bodies because those bodies surely die. We are not our bodies. There is some immortal part of ourselves, the soul, the essence, the spirit. That's what, that's what reincarnates. And the focus, I believe, of the lost civilization was upon that immortal essence of the human being for a very long period of time. Uh, but that it gradually fell away from that and, and devolved into materialism, but that primarily it was not a materialistic society. And we should not expect to find recognizable material traces of the kind of industrial technology that we've created in the 20th and 21st centuries. Do you feel as though shamanic plants, um, you know, visionary, visionary plants might have played a role in this, um, this study of our own mortality, of, of death in Egyptian culture? I'm certain they did. Um, indeed, the Egyptian, the ancient Egyptians did put their best minds to work for 3,000 years on the mystery of what happens to us uh, when we die. And in that project, um, they had aid from a number of plant allies. Um, we, we know that uh, Nymphaea cerulea, the, the blue water lily, uh, is um, a, a, a mild visionary plant. Um, interestingly, uh, and it's my friend, Dennis McKenna, who is an ethnopharmacologist, uh, who's made this identification, which is that the ancient Egyptian tree of life, which you see in huge numbers of reliefs uh, around, around ancient Egypt, and often you'll see the god Thoth, the god of wisdom, writing the name of an individual upon the tree of life. That means that individual has graduated from earthly life into the life of millions of years. Well, it turns out that the tree of life is Acacia nilotica, according to Dennis's um, uh, estimation, and that Acacia nilotica is rich in dimethyltryptamine, uh, in, in DMT, the most powerful hallucinogen known to man. And the fact that it's the tree of life in ancient Egypt is really intriguing, and, and uh, we should absolutely consider the possibility that we do know what the ancient Egyptians were smoking. Would well, your own experience with ayahuasca give you any extra insights, uh, at, you know, as to what happens after we die, as to, you know, this possibility of, you know, reincarnation and, you know. My experiences with ayahuasca, again, I can't prove that this is correct. I can only tell you the, the impact upon me. My experiences with, with ayahuasca have made me understand that everything we do in this life matters. Um, everything counts. Everything, everything will be weighed up and, and considered. We are being given a precious opportunity to be born in a human body. It is a very rare opportunity in the universe as a whole. Uh, to be a human being, to have the fine powers of discernment between good and bad, light and darkness, that human beings do have to have the capacity for love and, sadly, the capacity for hate. Uh, all of these things are part of the miracle of being born in a human body. Uh, it's up to us to live up to that miracle, to fulfill it. Do we want to spend our lives just pursuing material goals and objectives? If we do, we will not be nurturing that non-physical part of ourselves uh, at all. And it seems to me that the ancient Egyptians were very focused upon this. And that's why actually you don't find remains of people's houses and personal possessions very much in ancient Egypt. I don't think they cared about that. Towards the end of Egyptian civilization, Herodotus visited that country and described them as the happiest people on earth. <laughs> They'd been happy for 3,000 years, you know, and their happiness came primarily not from focusing on the material realm, but for living life in a way that nurtures spirit. Ultimately, what we're all here to do is to give love. To, to act with love towards one another. That is, that is the fundamental truth that, that emerges from ancient Egyptian civilization and from all the civilizations. And the further that we move away from love, 
and the more deeply we get drawn down into materialism, the less chance we have of uh, fulfilling our mission here. I couldn't, I couldn't uh, think of a better way to end this talk. Good. That was, uh, that was profound. Thank you for that. Any, any closing thoughts? No, I think we've, um, I think we've, you know, wrapped it up in a fairly, uh, fairly tight way, which is good. No, no need to ramble on endlessly. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Hopefully, hopefully we can do it again. This is, this is, this is like a dream come true for me. I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be calling my buddies and be like, ah, guess who I got to talk to today? Great, great. <laughs> great. Well, I'd love to do it again. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll definitely, definitely do that.